You can't be the next Taylor Swift unless you're already being the next Taylor Swift at 15 years old. Like you will not be LeBron James unless you are already a high school star. Like there has to be what I call the reasonable probability of success. I get it. Aim high, big dreams. Everybody's been taught that. And unfortunately, we've been overtaught that. You know, I get asked a lot by CEOs if I can teach their teams confidence. And it's like, oh, of course. No, confidence isn't something you teach. Confidence comes from the belief in the value you bring to others. Let me say that one more time. Today's guest is an award-winning film director and television producer, best known for his documentaries like Why I'm Not on Facebook and his TV shows Bar Rescue, Extreme Weight Loss, and My Cat from Hell. But really, why I wanted to have him on this podcast is because he is the author of this book right here, The Three-Minute Rule, where he breaks down how to deliver a pitch or presentation that grabs attention, tells a story, while saying less and getting more. You have to hear his story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Brant Pinvidic. The place that I want to start with, actually, uh, so I, I went to film school back in 2003 to become a documentary filmmaker. Cool. And uh, then I never made any documentaries. Uh, I mean, I went into corporate, I went to advertising, I went to production and all of those things. But um, I always found that, uh, that the thought of moving forward with something with intention, but then not really knowing how it'll play out, um, uh, if it would play out, is, is both exciting. You know, I remember in film school, my, my teacher saying that you need a God moment. Like, like you go with intention, but then you hope something really happens on camera that you can capture, that you can build your story around and whatnot. Yeah. And I just found that uncertainty uh, uh, um, uh, overwhelming uh, for yourself as, as a filmmaker, as someone who's deep into the documentary world. How do you proceed with these things with intention without ever knowing the outcome? Um. It depends what you mean by knowing the outcome, right? You're looking at it from a creative standpoint. I don't know the outcome. I'm going to follow the story. Unfortunately, I didn't get the luxury of developing those sort of creative instincts, right? I'm a business guy at heart. I'm a producer. I'm a sales guy. I ran a network. Like I don't have the creative purity to be like, where's the story going? My Hmm. journey in the documentary film always been around the idea that like, oh, like what is it going to look like when it's done? How am I going to sell it? Like, how do I wrap this story up? Like I'm looking for the end point from a story perspective, as in, I want this to be great. I want the finished product to be a certain way and not from a exploratory sort of, I just hope that it comes out. That's not really the way I do it. Unfortunately, I just don't have the creative integrity to pull that off. Well, but I, I, I actually think you've hit on a really good point uh, as well. So when you're approaching uh, the types of projects that you approach, so you, you know, your podcast, uh, the, the work that you've done as the, you know, CEO of different organizations responsible for producing content and, and television and entertainment and what have you, are you always thinking in the back of your mind, audience, how do I sell this? You know, what's the impact? What does this feel like? Uh, is, is that what you're focusing on? Yeah. Yeah, it pretty well is. I mean, even when it's, even when it's creatively, like, so when I did what the, the why I'm not podcast and the series of the documentary films, they're very authentic. Like it's, I mean, it doesn't get any more authentic because that's what sells. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, it's a double-edged sword in that way where it's like, yeah, that's my daughter. I'm really exploring Pokemon Go. I really was actually fascinated by Pokemon Go and why it was doing that. And that's why I did that short. But at the end of the day, like I wouldn't have done it if I didn't know it, was gonna, it wasn't going to, like I knew it was going to sell because of the subject matter, right? And so same thing with TV shows as I'm looking in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm producing a lot of them from an authentic position and playing it in, in a real sense, but it's because I know that sells. And I also know that even in, the, in, the, in my podcast space, it's like the same thing. If I genuinely look at a subject and be sort of like honest and vulnerable and detailed and, you know, unabashed about how I approach it, it will sell better. People will like it better. Like people sniff out that stuff. So it's a little of both, but it's more to, I'm always thinking like, how am I going to sell it? How does that work in the sale? And 
do you think others do this well enough? Um, I don't actually, that's a great question. No, I think if people did that more, they'd have more commercial success. Hmm. And at the end of the day, a lot of people want commercial success, right? Like that's what they really want. And they want to be artistic and they want to do what they want, but they want commercial success to validate it. And so what you find is there's a fine, there's a fine line between that. It's like when I, I teach a lot at schools, right? And I donate my time to teach high school kids. I will speak for free to any school, anytime I train teachers. Uh, like I love that space. And, you know, the youth is the future, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I always say the same thing. I start with the phrase I put up on the screen is who here believes that you can, you know, you can do anything you set your mind to. And sure enough, they all put up their hands. I was like, really? Could you be the next Ed Sheeran if you really wanted to do that badly, if you really thought of it? And like every once in a while, one of the kids will be like, yeah, I could. I'm like, no, you can't. Like he's one of the best in the world, in the history of the world. Like you can't be the next Taylor Swift unless you're already being the next Taylor Swift at 15 years old. Like you will not be LeBron James unless you are already a high school star. Like there has to be what I call the reasonable probability of success, mm -hmm. right? I get it. Aim high, big dreams. Everybody's been taught that. And unfortunately we've been overtaught that, that you can do anything you set your mind to. It's like, no, you can't. You should set your mind to anything you can do. Whatever you can do successfully, you should be setting and dedicating yourself to that. But you should not get into the idea that you can just do anything you want to. It doesn't work like that. And it's the same thing in any of the creative mediums. No, it doesn't. You can't just magically do things. And somebody will point to the Rocky story with Sylvester Stallone who held tight to his creative vision. And it's like, that's yeah, not how that went. Dog. Had to sell his dog and then go back and try and buy him back and all of that. You stuff, know what right? it's like? And, and it was like, he wanted to play the part and, la, la, la. and it's like, yeah, well, okay. But he had a viably commercial product that people were bidding for. Oh, mm. oh, then you can have some creative integrity. Yes, you can. If you have something that everybody wants, you can make decisions that are a little more in the crazy. You can do that. But you know how often that happens? Not very often. So, you know, it's like try balancing and, and, and helping people balance the idea for the vision of their company and what they want as to what is realistic and what is a, a goal that they could actually achieve and where the value is to the customer, sometimes that's a bit of a struggle for me. And the reason why I wanted to ask you specifically about your background in documentary filmmaking and storytelling and intention and all of those things is, uh, you know, I think that more so than other storytelling techniques, documentary filmmaking uh, captures uh, like a certain amount of truth. But, but what I found most intriguing when I was in film school and then later what got me into advertising is... Uh, the truth can be manipulated. And I know reality TV has made that um, like kind of over the top, but yeah. I, I remember this moment. I remember this moment where in, in post I was sitting there in editing, I was sitting there and I, I needed this moment to like really build up. And, and, and I had someone respond with this line about the death of the death of their mother. And, and that family isn't really that important. And then they started talking again. And so we like, we cut out the, the audio. We, we, we ramp time ramped into slow motion while they swallowed very slowly. And then we brought the music up in the swell and we'd really dragged out the moment. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like I can take this thing that happened that should have been really impactful. That wasn't and make it so much more for the audience. Like I could craft yeah. an emotion and a message. And I fell in love with manipulating the story to be whatever I want it to be. Uh, you know, and, and I think that makes us better storytellers. Uh, but I bump up against other people who go like, well, that's not the truth. And it's like, well, my job isn't to be a journalist. Right. My job is to be a, a, an entertainer or a storyteller for the story that I want to right. tell. And that doesn't have to necessarily be exactly what happened. How do you, how do you find P you yourself, balance that out in the world that you're in well the <laughs> the truth is i don't usually try to balance it much at all because i've never been a journalist in that side and i'm not trying to uncover truths you know what i mean i've done more serious stuff and i wouldn't do that but i've also taken people's 
words that they said in the interview from a day before and spliced them into a sentence that they say today and covered it with pictures so you can't see that it doesn't match their lips and had them say the complete opposite of what they were saying. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be anywhere near Greg. I'm in love with Greg. Like I, uh, that's just producing 101 when it comes to reality TV. It is not a documentary in the sense we're trying to to show you a journey of of discovery. It is watch real people do real and like be entertained by the story of that, right? And so even when I do films and stuff like that, unless it's something that's like, hey, I'm really uncovering this as it goes, which I don't do a lot of that, then I don't worry about it. I'm thinking like, what makes this scene great? You mm-hmm. know, like what makes this work? What makes this fun? And what elements of this do I want to play into? And so you 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 do have to be careful about altering those sort of the truths, quote unquote, in real time or in post time. Those are two very different things. Hmm. If you're trying to alter it in real time, you are screwed. The audience will pick up on it instantly. They will pick up on it instantly. You can't fake anything anymore. And everybody's too sensitive to it. In post, you can lead the audience, but you can't do it in real time. Hmm. I used to have these little tricks. I We did, a, we followed a very, very wealthy um, people who decided that they were going to spend their summer doing touring car racing. I don't know if you know anything about racing, but touring car racing is basically self-paid. And so if you have half a million or a million dollars a year, you want to spend on it, it's a great hobby. So we would follow these people around and, you know, these are people who are very successful. They have fairly large egos. They want to win. And so we would go to one person and say, Hey, how did you feel about how Jim treated you on the track? And then he would say something. Then we go to Jim and we'd say, Hey, Jim, or this person said this about you. And then we'd go back to the first person and say, Hey, this is what this guy just said about you now. And yeah. we would f- try to figure out ways to just build a little bit more conflict, <laughs> you know, in, in, well, <laughs> because things are pretty boring sometimes. <laughs> but, I mean, that is, that was, that's what I do every single day producing a TV show. That's all you do. Well, I was going to ask. Right. So, so other than, character and conflict the, you know, and specificity, I guess, the, the, the three staples of, of storytelling. What are other things that, that are really, in your opinion, core, regardless of the medium you're, you're speaking through, what's really core to being able to capture attention and, and, and share and tell a story? I mean, for me, it's expectation. Hmm. It's matching, meeting, creating, the expectation for the audience. That is what we do as audience. And there's a, you know, it's, it's a lot of like, when I teach on stage, it's like, it's a lot of breadcrumbs. Like you're, you're leading a trail of breadcrumbs, not spraying the audience with information in a shotgun. Right. Mm. Um, We have very short attention spans these days. And so we need very like really crisp, really clean, pieces of information that lead you through your story and whatever that is, whether you're pitching a company, raising money, or whether you're telling a story on a screen, it has to be like crisp, clean nuggets of information that are easily digestible that lead you to the next one. And that more so than ever, just because of the way people consume information, it's like, yeah, I need something intellectually stimulating for my attention span right this second. You got like, you know, eight seconds to do that. Nope. I'm on to something else. So unless you're building that and, you know, Chuck Lorre did it so well. Mm. If you watch two and a half men, there is a joke every 7.2 seconds. He makes, he, he talks about all the time. It's a seven second cycle he runs. And so he's expecting someone to say something where they have to press that laugh track every seven seconds. And, and there's a reason. I was like, it doesn't have to be genius. It doesn't have to be knee slapping funny. It just has to be continually laying, layering that. And then he can pull and recall and just keep overlaying it on and on and on. And it just keeps people to the next piece, to the next piece of the story. Hmm. And when you watch that and you look at it for that, and I've done it with classes where I'm timing it with them and you're like, holy crap, he really is doing that. It's like, yeah. So when are you going to not watch? When, when do you turn the channel here? Like what, what is your thing on, on second four? Like it's pretty hard. Right. You know, he has to miss with 
seven jokes in a row before you're like, oh, that was a lot. The minute was too boring. I'm out. Like, you know, he's got, he's got a couple minutes that you'll test this out. So that means he's going to have 15 jokes for you. And I, I've heard writers, you know, specifically of transition. I, I recall hearing a writer who transitioned from, I think, Friends to um, the West Wing. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I remember listening to the writer speak about the fact that, you know, when you're when you're working in a sitcom, for example, and you have to make sure that you have your commercial breaks and that you have your arcs and you have your multiple a, ABC stories and they all work together and stuff. I just think, my goodness, like uh, what a, a challenging constraining environment to try and make this thing work in your own experience how, how have you either embraced or dealt with constraints um and i don't deal with them well to be you honest. don't <laughs> no i'm pretty contrary by nature okay and so um it's very difficult to realize that the the at a high level professional grade kind of stuff when you're dealing with the lines are painted on the road for a reason. Okay. And that's very hard to get used to. Um, and like the box is built for a reason. And so, yes, thinking outside the box is cool and painting outside the lines is cool, but at a certain level in any sophisticated industry, those things are there by trial and error and history of people that are much smarter than you and have done it you know, more successfully. And so you might catch a break. Maybe you wrote Memento and that is outside of all the conventions. Good for you. You know, have you seen Tenet that's though? That's the last, that's one. Okay. One, <laughs> right. Uh, maybe you're David and you can do lost a story that goes nowhere with no rhyme or reason. And it becomes a big show. Okay, great. That's one. Right. Right. One of my closest friends and um, mentors was Stephen J. Cannell. And he did the A-Team and among dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of other shows. And it's like that show ended the exact same way. Every episode was identical. And it's like, it wasn't because he was boring. It wasn't because he was simple. It was because that structure was genius. And it was right. laid out that way for a reason. And in a one hour drama, it is untouchable. And that's why CSI and NCIS and Law and & Order and all these ones, they stayed on the air for dozens and dozens of seasons and made billions and billions of dollars because the formula was identical and it works. CSI was the same show every week, you know, and same thing with companies. And I work with a lot of startups and whatnot. And like, there are reasons why things work a certain way. So you don't always need to break the restraints and not be constrained. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you have to accept the fact that there's a reason why those things work and being contrarian in, in a, in a high level professional setting, big rewards, but big risks. And so when you say though, that you're, that you do not handle those um, constraints well is, do you find yourself, you know, swimming in your own stream more often than not and, and taking yeah. those risks. <laughs> I find myself taking shortcuts that end up being the longer way around. That's just the reality. I teach my students that all the time. Don't why, try to take why, a shortcut. Why do you do that? Um, I think because I just feel like I'm the smartest guy in the room all the time. Like that's the way my brain works. Like I just think I know how to do things. And so I see where I am today, I have big visions. I'm a, I'm a creative. I have, I'm a visionary in that sense. So I see the end goal and I look and I go, the path from here to that end goal is fastest this way. Mm -hmm. And everybody else who's done it has done the long windy way and, and got degrees and, and they went and researched this and then they were apprentices here. And like, you know what I mean? Like the there's processes and I'm just yeah. like, no, I just want to go do that. And so by the time I end up being successful at it, it's like, oh God, if I would have just started at the beginning and done it properly and stayed within the lines, like I would have been here anyways, you know? <laughs> and even within TV, my own career, like, yeah, you know, it was a pretty wild and fun and interesting and successful path. But if I would have just out of college gone and got a job at the William Morris mailroom and went through the process, I'd probably be richer 
And I probably would have done more like, you know, cause I spent 12 or 15 years banging my head against the wall, trying to learn other lessons that uh, eventually paid off in television. But, you know, I was 30 years old before that started to click. So I could have done that. I could have done that the traditional way and probably developed more skills and made more, even more money. And you, you may not be the type of person to look back with, with, you know, regret or, you, you know, you might be very future focused, but um, how do you feel, I guess, about that decade spent in the wilderness? I mean, I am incredibly future focused and I'm a complete and total delusional optimist. Right. <laughs> um, and as an entrepreneur, you need that. Like, it doesn't matter what happens. It's all still going to work out. It'll all be fine. So as I'm sitting here, I'm still going like, oh my God, I'm so lucky. I can't believe this has worked out. Like, and the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. like I'm keep chasing it. I'm, I try to stay ahead of it. So I'm, I'm trying to chase it. So that helps, right? Because it's like, I don't want to look back at what I could have done differently. Cause if I would have done something differently, someone would have figured out that I'm not qualified to be here. Right. Mm -hmm. So that helps a little bit when I look back and like, I just say to people, you know, you can't use my journey as a roadmap. It doesn't work like that. You can't use anybody else's success story as a roadmap. Okay. You're just looking at a highlight reel mm -hmm. and you don't see the end of the things that, that get that, that I had to go through to get here. And so it, it's important to find your own route. You just don't want to do it. You want to try to make it as, as little as hard way as possible. You don't want to take the hard way and bashing a new trail is a hard way to go. And it's like, you can learn from my experiences and you might be able to carve a better path. Hmm. Well, it's, this is the, we do hard things podcast. So, you know, we want to focus on and, and, and speak about some of the hard lessons that we had to learn yeah. either the difficult or the embarrassing things. Uh, so, so, you know, during that time, I mean, what were some of the, some of the, some of the most challenging things that you faced uh, and not necessarily that you wish you could take back because, because they shaped you into who you are, but what are some of the hard lessons learned? I think it's like, it's the insecurity right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a doctor and you're a surgeon, for example, you have a very clear track record. I perform this many surgeries. I'm disqualified. I can do this neuro procedure. Like you have the backing, you have the history. It's sitting there. It's, mm -hmm. it's clear in, in a creative industry like this. It's like, we used to always joke, like none of us are qualified for these jobs. Like that's just all there is to it. Like I don't have any marketable skills. That's what we, that's what everybody in the industry feels that other than this one tiny carved out piece of our, our life, what I do would be worthless otherwise. And you look at other people who have nine to fives and, but they have like marketable skills that they've developed and honed and, and are commodities. They can trade on them where it's just like, I'm only as good as the next show I sell. That's really hard. Um, particularly when you're in the transition from, I'm just thankful to be here. I'm just glad I have a job when you're first starting out in the entertainment mm -hmm. industry. And until you get to the point where it's like, oh, I don't care anymore because I've already got enough credits and enough money. That middle ground of like, I want to do good things. Where do I, how do I advance? You know, how do I, how do I achieve the next level? How to become real successful? It's very difficult because you don't have, you never feel like you have a solid platform. Hmm. Like we run companies, but we're not the best business operators in the world. Like we produce television, but we're, but we're not the core storytellers. We're usually not the writers or whatnot. Right. And everybody's got their deficiencies. You know, the writers of this, of this world are, are useless in a room pitching shows. They're useless in social settings. Most of them like, if you're really good in a room, you're probably bad on a page. So everybody's got their shortcomings. And this is an industry that like you have to uh, cover those. And so imposter syndrome is very, very prevalent. Um, and so that was really hard for me coming from a background what, in Canada where do? I really wasn't what did you do to fight that as a television producer. A delusional optimism is how I used did it, right? Okay. So you just, you just drove forward. I just overpower. Just... You're like, whatever. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I it's a big hub of how I got to the United States. I get a big fancy job. I've never produced anything in my life at a real level. Right. I get in, I sell, a, I sell a pilot 
to CMT. It's a muscle car makeover show where a big country music band is making over muscle cars. Really cool. And we do a pilot. We go to Vegas to do the focus group. And we're sitting there at the focus group. I'm kind of like, this is so cool. I've only seen this on TV before. I can't believe this, you know? And the guy who's running the focus group comes out and the president of the network and I are sitting right there and he goes, hey, um, okay, we're about to get started. You guys want to use the slide or the dial for the interaction tech elements? And the president of the network turns to me and goes, I don't know, Brant, you've done this more than I have. What do you want to do? <laughs> and you're like, I have no idea what either of those things mean. I was like, I like the slide, but it, it's not that much different. And the guy's like, yeah, you're right. We can go either way. Let's go with the slide. <laughs> right? So that mentality of thank God I, I cleared that situation. Otherwise he would have realized I'm a fraud kind of stays with you. Right. And then oof, less than four years later, I'm the head of programming for a major cable network. And it's like, Oh my God, I, I, I guess I know these things now. Like mm. it sneaks up on you where you realize, wait a minute, I'm not faking this anymore. And so then you get to a point in that business where it's like, okay, I, you know, I'm relatively well regarded. I'm one of the better, you know, more prolific producers in that world. And, you know, there's always somebody bigger and better and badder and richer. That's fine. I admire that. But then as I got out of that business and started, you know, moving into the business consulting and I wrote the book and whatnot, then it's like, oh, uh, I'm on a plane going to, to consult with a company who has a type one diabetes anti-rejection therapy drug. And they're hiring me to come help them develop their story. And I'm like, they're going to figure out that I don't know anything about anything as soon as I get there. And you know, we're, this guy is a but that's not true, CEO is a wing like, of the hospital named after him. Yeah. But you're, you're but you know, I, I don't know. That's not true. Right. You talk about non-transferable skills. I mean, storytelling and um, being able to, you know, communicate the message that you want to communicate wrapped within the package that people will want to consume. And you said, you know how to sell and you know how to do all those things. So, so, you know, I said, when you say type one diabetes medication or whatnot, you know, I work with those types of clients all the time. And so I, I don't need to know what they know. I just need to know how to communicate, uh, you know, and to a target audience. It sounds great. When you say it, when you say it, it sounds great. But okay. when you're on the plane and you've just, you've already cashed their first check. Okay. You're like, and they're tripping over the diplomas as they're waltzing you down the hall to the conference room. It's bloody well nerve wracking. Right. And then we're in the room and after 20 minutes, it's like, wait a second. Like, so other than this gene therapy thing, you guys don't know anything about anything is what it, <laughs> I'm smarter about every other element about this business other than that part. So this actually could work really well. And so like you build the confidence on that, but it doesn't matter because every, the next time something else will come along, you know, like I'm, I'm get, I'm pretty deep into the SPAC and, or, you know, reverse acquisitions of public company stuff right now. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Somebody will ask me something or I'm taking a meeting with someone and I'm like, Oh my God, like I, I don't know how to do like, this is way out of my depth. And it's like, when does that end? Oh, guess what? Never. You know, that's the way life is. Mm. So tell me about, about the three-minute rule. So the three-minute rule actually started as sort of a rule we used to use in the development department when we were developing shows is that no tape that we sold a show on could be longer than three minutes, no matter what. And we would watch a tape and it'd be so great, it'd be four minutes and 10 seconds. It's like, nope, sorry, can't do it. Not sending it out, go edit it. And I realized with my first, very first client was an oil and gas exploration company and small cap company. And, and they just asked me to help, an investment banker asked me to help him with his story because he was so bad at his presentation. And, you know, I don't know anything about oil and gas at the time. And I don't know anything about it much outside of the TV world at the time. And I was just like, well, I'll just build your story the way I'd build a TV show pitch. And I just blocked it out and laid it out and did my little post-it notes and all the, the twists that I do and got his story into this sort of three minute piece. And two weeks later, he sent me, you know, he, he left me a voicemail and he was like, you could see, he was, you could hear his emotion in the phone. He was almost breaking up. And he was just saying, you changed my life. I'll never forget what you've done for me. I used to hate going on the road. It was the worst thing about my life. And now I'm excited to tell my story to people and the stock's up. We completed our raise and you know, I don't know how to thank you. Well, it would have been nice if you sent me some more options, but whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the stock is, maybe it's trading a hundred dollars today, the bugger. But 
the, the moral of the story was, is I was like, oh my God, no network president has ever said that to me ever. And I am one chromosome away from being a caveman. And my ego was like, oh, I want more of this. And so the investment bank was like, I have another client. Will you work with them? I was like, oh, uh, hell yes. And so it started and I realized the format of breaking down an idea into its core elements and illustrating it to an audience cleanly, clearly, and concisely was valuable across any industry. It didn't matter if it was a micro cap biotech company or the San Francisco 49ers pitching the WWE for WrestleMania. Like none of that mattered. It only mattered that like the structure and the storytelling and the techniques were better. And that's when I decided like, I'm done with TV on a day-to-day basis. And I sold my company and I decided to write a book and, you know, Penguin Random House and I went, went around the block and seemed to do pretty well. The book was a big bestseller. So that opened another whole other doors. And now it's kind of all I do really is find companies to help tell their stories. And typically where are the areas that people tend to fail at this? Um, without, without question, the number one issue is they have too much information that they want to dump on somebody as quickly as possible. And that is the real problem is that when you understand what you do so well, you think that all of the pieces of information are valuable and they are, but only in context. And until you give someone the concept, they don't understand the context. And until they have the concept and the context, they don't understand what the action items or the upside will be. And that's just the way we understand, right? That's, we don't actualize until we understand, until we conceptualize and then we contextualize. Once we do that, we can actualize. And so getting people to stop overpowering with information and breaking it down into a, into a story that is a layer of breadcrumbs leading people to a conclusion as opposed to a shotgun blasting them with information, by far the number one mistake I see. Hmm. So when it comes to playing with perspectives or playing uh, with time or, um, you know, these, these other kind of, you know, I, I quite like the E storytelling technique where you start here and then you drive a little bit forward and then you say, wait, let's take a step back and you go back in time and then you catch back up to the future and then you go further forward. So outside of some of these kind of playful structure things, yeah. um, what, what are the most important elements to, to really nailing this? Um, well, in the book, I talk about the four pillars of the story structure, right? From a, from a presentation standpoint, um, mostly because we have such a short attention span, the audience is very skeptical. And so you really don't have a lot of time and you can't make grand gestures and big promises, right? We've been, we've been over-promised and under-delivered in marketing for the last two decades, none of that stuff works. So I use what's called the WAC method, W-H-A-C, which is what is it? How does it work? Are you sure about that? And can you do it? And that is the structure of the way people understand and make decisions in, in their life in every else. So first I have to understand what it is. Okay, what is it we're talking about? What do you do? Okay, how does it work? What, and you, if you hear someone droning on about something, your brain will say, okay, stop. Could you just tell me what this is and how this works? Like, that's what we want. So I train people to like, start with what it is. What do you do? What is the company? What's its prime focus? Okay, what is it? How does it work? Okay, now I know what you do. How do you actually do that? Okay. Mm-hmm. And once you establish that, then you can talk about the facts, the figures, the logic, and reason of that, right? Most people want to start with their big facts. You know, when people start a presentation with uh, the size of the market, like the size of the market of the market cap of the industry of the sweater is like, and it's like, Oh my God, I don't even know what you're talking about yet. I don't care how big the market is. Once I understand what you do and how it works. Now I understand the con like all of these elements, right? Give context to it. And that's it. And then can you do it is how do we get involved? What's next? Are you the one to deliver it? What's the process, right? People think that's the most important thing. And it's not, if I understand just- what it is and how it works and I believe that it's going to work and the future looks bright, I'll figure out a way to make it happen. If it's too, if it's too much money, I'll pay that. If it's not available now, I'll wait. If it's, you're not the right person to deliver it, I'll help find somebody that will like, 
the, the money, the, the, the solution will come. You know, it's not important who you are. Nobody gives a crap who you are right now. Well, so, so how, how does this bump up then this, the idea of starting with what and then focusing on who and then moving through it that way? How does this bump up against uh, start with why and, and the whole idea of starting with why and intention and purpose and mission and then and then focusing on, you know, on the how and then finally arriving at the what? Yeah. And, and honestly, if we had a time machine, we can go back to the 90s. That would that works better because people haven't heard it a billion times. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like why you want to do this. You know, the, the reason for being doesn't work as a functionality of the pitch until I understand what it is you're doing. And so there are two options for that. The why I usually have people build it into what's called their reason for being, which is kind of the opening before you start the pitch, the small talk, the details is like, why are you there? How did this come to be? Right. What's your story that makes sense on this? Um, I'll give you a great example. So the company that I started with, I had actually said no to them a couple of times until I met their CEO. Her, sto- her opening story is like this. She was the, she, she grew up since nine years old in her parents' electric motor shop. She's been able to wind an electric motor since she was not nine years old, literally. She started with GE and various other companies. She became the, the CEO of GE Small Industrial Electric Motors, the highest profile position you can get in the electric motor industry. And in that position, she had seen, you know, multiple different ideas and technology come from this one small company kept pestering her. She finally said one phrase that changed her life. She said, show me your technology. And they did. 30 days later, she had resigned her position at General Electric, moved her entire family to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and became the CEO of Exro Technologies. Okay. That's her opening. Now, you don't even know what the company is, but just hearing that story makes you like, well, I got to know what the technology is. Hmm. You already know it's a, you already know that this is about a technology that the CEO of GE couldn't resist and move to Calgary Verde to do. So now she doesn't start with saying like, we're extra technologies. We have a revolutionary technology in electric motor industry, right? That's not how it starts. She told you why she's there and why this is. And then, and after she tells you that you're like, okay, she goes, no, let me tell you about extra. And the way that starts is Xro is a technology company. We make software for the controllers of electric motors. Okay, so what does a company do? They make software for the controller of electric motors. That's pretty clear now. Yep. Right? Like, I'm already on the page. And she's like, we know this technology. Okay, that's great. Now I get it. How does it work? We integrate into the controller, making the entire motor and powertrain system smarter. We use what's called coil driving technology. We're the first company to develop a real-time coil switching elements. What? So now it's like, okay, I know what you do, how that works. But like, what does that even mean? Well, it means that an electric motor powered by an extra uh, coil driver can get high end speed and low end torque from the same motor. Electric vehicle manufacturers that use two motors and multiple gearboxes can eliminate all that and get it out of one motor. And you're like, okay, now that's cool. And it's like, here's the data on our real world trial on a Potencia vehicle. As you can see, 30% more growth from the same motor with just software. Here's how it works. We're not a plug and play. We got to put, we got to take our manufacturing partners and put them in the lab and develop the algorithm and the software specifically for their motor. It's about a 30 day process. That's it. So that's about a two minute pitch on a billion dollar company that they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars developing technology. And she will pitch that out in two minutes and, you know, they, they raised more money than they ever knew what to do with. And the stock is soaring and they have more partners than they will do it. Cause it's like, you get it. You don't have to know anything about electric motors. And you're already like, I get it. I got it. Now she's got to go into a high level detail about how the coil switching is done and how the manufacturing process, but that's how powerful a clean and crisp story is. There's nothing else. There's no fluff. It's just the facts. And she's, and when you say it in such a clean and clear, confident way, people are drawn to it like crazy. It just makes me wonder why more people don't just 
do this. I mean, it's, it sounds simple. It sounds, <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, you talk about the, the, the insecurity, you talk about the, um, you talk about the, uh, imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then now I just said, why don't more people do this? And you laugh. <laughs> it's like, it's because it's hard. And by the way, three minute rule.com, get the book. You'll be able to do it. It's, yes. it's it, 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 listen, it's hard because you know, I get asked a lot by CEOs, big CEOs sometimes, if I can teach their teams confidence. And it's like, oh, of course. No, it's not what it, confidence isn't something you teach, right? You can teach the mannerisms that look like confidence, but that's not confidence. Confidence comes from the belief in the value you bring to others. Let me say that one more time. Confidence comes in the belief in the value you bring to others. If I was pitching you at your wedding, I'm the caterer and I want you to sign off on the, on the chef to be there and cook for your illustrious guests. And I had Gordon Ramsay as the chef. How many words would I need to sell you that idea? Four words. I have Gordon Ramsay, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to sell you. I wouldn't tell you about his stats. I wouldn't show you his Michelin stars. I wouldn't have to pull up YouTube videos for it. I wouldn't try to compare him to other chefs. Nope. And how would I be feeling? And I would have supreme confidence. Conversely, if it was my brother-in-law who just got out of prison, doesn't really cook, but really needs a job and is putting a lot of pressure on me, how many words might I try to use to get you to sign off on that, right? And how am I going to be? I'm not going to feel very confident. I'm going to use a ton of words. And even if I have the mannerisms of confidence, puffy chest, big smile, right? you are going to smell that a mile away and you're going to sense the overpromotion. And that's just the way the world is right now. And so there's a scale and I use this on stage all the time. There's a scale. The, the level of confidence in the value you are bringing to others is directly proportionate to the number of words you use. And so the more words you use during your pitch is going to show your audience where you are on the scale of value. The more you talk, the more you push, the more you sell, the more you try to explain, the less value you are literally figuratively subconsciously telling your audience you bring <laughs> for our audio listeners he dropped the mic i just and he yeah, gave a little awesome. mind blown symbol <laughs> yeah that's right there you go. i need the sound effect i need the sound effect <laughs> yeah. and so for you know uh, I, I think of you know uh, people who talk about, oh, I, I've tried, I've tried, I've done this, I've tried. And then you say, okay, let's take a look at what you've tried. And they go, ah, oh, I don't really have anything to show. So what's the best place to get started other than buying your book, of course? <laughs> um, the best place to get started is to, do, the very first exercise is called, is, well, there's two. The first one is the pyramid of information is something I wish I'd put more about in this book because it's been so valuable to people. But pyramid of information is basically if you only had five words to start to explain it. And then after you did that and you could get it to five, then you take 15, then you take 40 words, then you take 80 words, then you take nine sentences, right? If you only had five words to explain your idea, could you do it? Like, what would you do if you had to use the what meets what, right? Uh, I'll pitch you a show. Five words. The amazing race for the smartest people on the planet. So mm -hmm. six words. How do you pitch a, how do you pitch a television show in five or six words? But you already know, if you know the amazing race, you know how it works, right? Mm -hmm. Hapless people, like an Ikea furniture building, facing <laughs> point to point. Smartest people in the world means it's got to be like a higher level race of smart people. Well, it's like, yeah, that is actually what the show is. So, okay, so now you get six words. Now it's like, if I was going to add some more words, I'd be like, okay, it's MIT grads, Boeing engineers competing in the biggest challenges in television. Okay, now I start to see it, you know, three teams of three racing across the country, two checkpoints each episode. Like that's how- Super low the story, social right? IQ. So they'll, they'll just- totally abruptly getting angry at everyone all the time. <laughs> Lots of conflict. So yeah, as, but here's the thing, like I, so far I've used about 40 words to explain that. And if you could probably talk about that show for the next 20 minutes. Yep. So 
that's more valuable than me talking about it for 20 minutes and you taking away 40 words, right? Because that's normally what happens. So that's a, that's a really good step. But to get that step, sometimes you need to do, and the very first step in the book is the bullet point challenge. I have people do a brainstorm where they literally write down single words, two or three word phrases about their business, everything you can possibly think of. And you take them in post-it notes and you stick them on the wall. And what it does is it keeps you from reusing the same phrases you've been using every time you've tried to pitch it or every time you try to tell the story, you fall in love with your own language, right? So it's like, this is TV show, amazing race, smart people, you know, big challenges, teams of three. Like you just write out all those little tiny things and then you start to see it and then you can start to categorize it. Well, let me ask you this question. So uh, I have a growth agency. We help businesses, B2B businesses basically generate leads. Yeah. The way we explain it is, you know who the right people are. You just need more of them. Yeah. We help you find those right people. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've always struggled to think that's just too simple. I mean, it's just like, it's no, just too simple. I get it. <laughs> no, that's exactly what you want. You want exactly that. And what's good about that is it's relatively good because it's also not too hypothetical in its sort of like general language. Like a lot of companies will be like, you know, we create a platform for natural growth in emerging industries. It's like, that's <laughs> what, what does that mean? Right. What does that even, what does that mean? Like that's just now. now I'm already pissed off at you. Cause like, what does that mean? So at least I know what you do. Like you generate leads for businesses right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, you're lead generating for business. I got it. Oh, great. How do you do that? Well, I like, that's what I want to know that. next. I, can I, I don't want to know anything else. I don't know. Who, I don't want to know who you are. I don't want to know your background. I don't want to know how much it costs. I don't know any, I just want to know how you do it first. Mm-hmm. Like I get it. Now I know what your company does. How do you do it? And then once you explain that, it's like, okay, I just want to know, like, does that actually work? Like, why is, why did you choose to do it that way? Why, why, what are your facts? What are your figures? Like, what's the logic behind that? Like, what's the reasoning that you do that? And it's like, once you validate that, like, okay, now we can really talk. How much is it? How long do you work with me? Blah, blah, blah. Does it work for my, like, then all those things happen after. Those happens later. But now I'm asking questions from a place of um, interest, and understanding. I understand your company and the value it brings. Now let's talk about how it works for me. And that's what you want. That was a lot of fun. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, to be successful, you don't need to be the most original person or have the most original idea. Instead, simply model the formulas or the practices of those who have already achieved success. They've done it, you can do it too. Number two, you will never be great at something if you never start. This is my problem. So just start. You'll figure it out as you go. And number three, real confidence. Real confidence comes from believing in the value you bring to others. The value you bring to others. So stop selling yourself short. Now remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one, the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. Down to to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do Eco Challenge. I get to do those things. Changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.